So thank you for uh, inviting me to give a presentation. Um, so uh, we were asked to give a version of the future research for the next uh, five years. And uh, I thought, I'm a theorist myself, but I thought uh, I, I like to play with data. And I thought what's going to be available in five years that will have a lot more data, uh, cosmological data in particular. And so I thought I will uh, give a presentation focusing on a few of these uh, experiments that are coming online in the next five years. Um, let me mention one here, which is called uh, this is not, yeah, all right. uh, which is called uh, DESI, um, the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. And it's a redshift uh, survey, uh, survey which measures uh, galaxy positions in the sky, but also measures their redshifts through the uh, uh, various techniques, like emission lines, uh, redshifts, and so on. And uh, it will give, it will measure the distribution of galaxies, three-dimensional distribution of galaxies, uh, out to much larger distance than what we have uh, today. Uh, here, uh, let me just give you an idea. You know, today we can do with the, with the ball server, we can do up to redshift 0.7. This is this uh, white and black area here. But with this, we'll be able to go up to redshift 2 uh, with so-called um, emission line galaxies, uh, gosh, and then uh, quasars and, uh, uh, and, and spectral quasars, we can go even, even further. So we'll, we'll measure you know, tens of millions uh, of uh, galaxy positions, and then the question is, what do we do with it? Well, uh, here is a picture of a sim simulation, actually, of these galaxy positions. And what you can see is that galaxies are, are close to each other. They like to be close to each other. They're correlated. Uh, for example, you know, in some cases, they are correlated along, along uh, filaments. Uh, in other cases, they are you know, clumped together into, in into clusters. Uh, and the simplest way to describe this correlation is to look at the two-point uh, two uh, correlation function of galaxies. Uh, I'm showing you an example from the current data here, from the BOSS data. Uh, but the point is, you know, you, you count over all possible pairs of galaxies, galaxy separations, and you uh, ask yourself what is the excess probability over random, and that's what is called the correlation function. And there's a lot of information in this correlation function. So I'm not going to go through all the possible uh, things that we can learn from this. Let me just give you a few uh, examples. Uh, let me start with the low-hanging you know, low fruit, uh, so to speak, which is um, the idea that we can actually observe how the uh, neutrino, uh, neutrinos look in our universe. Here's a picture of the dark matter uh, simulation. And you can see dark matter is similar to the, to, the, to the picture before of the galaxies. Dark matter is, is uh, clustered. Uh, we have particles along filaments. We have particles inside the clusters. You know, it's very strongly clustered. And that's because it's cold dark matter, and it, you know, it can cluster into small uh, things. Uh, the same picture uh, of the same patch of the universe simulated uh, with neutrinos looks like this. It's completely smooth, with the exception of a few small things here and there. And the reason for that is the neutrinos actually you know, have, um, they stream around. Uh, and they stream around for most of the time of the universe with actually speed of light. And then later, when they, got, when they get mass, uh, when the universe cools down enough, then they have uh, uh, speeds uh, smaller than speed of light, but still very, 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 very large speeds. And that means that the gravity just cannot uh, clump them together into, into these kind of clumps like the dark matter. And we would like to see that. We would like to see, uh, if we, because if we can see this, we can actually also determine what the mass of neutrinos is. The problem is that this uh, the contribution of neutrinos uh, to the total contribution of dark matter is about 1%. So it's a very, very small fraction. Uh, however, we did, we, in the you know, next five years, we think we'll get the sensitivity where we can actually uh, observe this separately from this. And the way we will do this is that basically the way to think about it is that the, the slide before I've shown the galaxies, pretty much uh, the galaxy position in the sky, they pretty much just trace the dark matter part. But then along the radial direction, uh, where we also have velocities, uh, we are tracing actually the, the sum of these two things. You know, and even though this one is only 1% to the total, it's nevertheless we're going to have such huge sensitivities that we'll be able to measure this and determine neutrino mass. All right, so uh, as I said, uh, this is like a, a simple uh, low-hanging fruit thing we can do. Let's move on now to some more challenging things we, uh, we can uh, try and do. Uh, we can test the uh, inflation with, um, with non-Gaussianities. Um, as we call. So there are many ways to test inflation. We heard some of them uh, before. Uh, but one way to test uh, some of these inflationary models is to look for the primordial non-Gaussianities. So uh, you know, inflation is a very good uh, Gaussian random number generator. But uh, in certain models, um, which go beyond the simplest uh, single field inflation, uh, there's also, there are also non-Gaussianities generated. Uh, and in a lot of these models that people talk about, uh, inspired by string theory and so on, they are actually, uh, they do predict uh, uh, strong non-Gaussianities. When I say strong, I really, it's really not strong at all. It, you know, we're talking about numbers of the level 10 to minus 4 to 10 to minus 5. 
I deliberately wrote it in terms of this. Uh, we, usually what we write in terms is we write in terms of dimensional number like f and l times phi, but phi is of order of few times 10 to the minus five. And that's why if f and l is of order unity, the signal itself is actually of order 10 to the minus five or 10 to the minus four. So it's a very small prediction. Uh, and you can ask, well, I mean, can we really possibly see something like that? Uh, in fact, here I'm just for, for fun, I've shown you two almost identical simulations. Uh, there are some differences if you go and look uh, in by eye, but these differences are at the level of 1%. So in, if you want to reach the sensitivity of level 10 to minus 4 or minus 5, we have to go yet another several orders of magnitude below this, and they would not show up on the screen as different at all. Nevertheless, we think we're going to be able to reach the sensitivities where uh, in five years, we should be able to probe um, uh, F and L of order unity uh, with this uh, large-scale surveys uh, like DESI. All right, so let me move on to something even more ambitious, which is uh, the testing the whole uh, multiverse picture. Um, now, as um, we, you probably know, the, in the inflation can generate the whole universe. And if it happens once, it can happen uh, many, many times, infinite times, perhaps. And that's a picture of the multiverse. And um, the obvious question is, can we see the other universes? Uh, in most cases, the answer is not, unless it happens to collide with our universe. Uh, but nevertheless, we can still, you know, in principle, test this picture by looking at the curvature of the universe. It turns out that if a baby universe is born out of a you know, vacuum uh, of the parent universe, then its curvature, spatial curvature, has to be negative. And if it's a slow roll inflation, then it maybe has to be zero, something like that. But we never have this situation. Uh, we never have a positive curvature. Um, if we go, so how do we you know, measure positive curvature and distinguish it from e either zero curvature or negative curvature? Well, the basic idea is you, you, you go and look at the sum of the angles in a triangle. And if the sum of the angles is more than 180 degrees, then you have a closed universe. And if it's 180 degrees, it's, it's a you know, flat universe. And if it's less than that, it's an open universe. So that's the basic idea, which we can do with cosmological data. And uh, right now, we can do this at the level of about 1%. That's the current limits. Uh, what is exciting is in the next five years, we should be able to improve these limits by, an by another factor of 10 to 15, uh, using DESI and Planck and other data. And so uh, with this, we should be able to approach uh, a level of few times n minus 4, which is not too far from the fundamental limit. It turns out we cannot do this um, much better than, I don't know, 10 to minus 4, maybe a few times less than that. That's the fundamental limit. So in the next uh, you know, few, uh, several years, we should be able to get us closer and closer to the fundamental limit, and maybe there's a surprise there. OK, it's, obviously, it's a long shot, but in principle, we could be rolling out a picture of the multiverse. All right, so um, I cannot give a talk about future data without mentioning uh, B modes of, polar, of uh, polarization. Uh, Andre already mentioned this. Uh, the basic picture is you take microwave background, which is the relic radiation from the early universe. You look at this polarization, you decompose it into two different types of polarization called E modes and B modes. And if you have primordial gravity waves, then these can generate B modes, uh, whereas normal fluctuations, uh, normal scalar fluctuations only generate E modes. That's the basic idea. And uh, as we have, of course, heard, it would be as close to a proof of inflation as, as any. Uh, and that's simply because no other theory predicts scale invariant gravity waves. Um, it would, of course, also be approved that gravity is quantized, the window into quantum gravity, and so on. So um, we you all probably know the story. You know, we thought we had it um, back in March. Um, now we're not so sure. But in a few weeks, actually, there will be a new release uh, from the joint uh, Planck and Bicep analysis that hopefully will shed some further light on this. But even if that uh, is still not going to give us the detection, nevertheless, there's more and more data coming from Bicep and Keck team, and also uh, from a whole other, uh, other uh, whole bunch of other experiments. So it really is a race to who's going to measure uh, R first. Uh, and it's a lot of experiments. Uh, in fact, I, I've just written down a few down here, and we had even more of them. So in the next five years, this is going to be you know, really exciting to watch this race going and seeing who's, you know, who gets there first. All right, so uh, what other things can we look for? Um, the, it turns out you know, there are so many things we can look for that uh, they don't, you know, I just, I'll just mention a few of them. Um, for example, obviously, dark energy properties is one of the things that actually these, several of these experiments have been uh, built for, are, are being built for. And they are in their names, dark energy spectroscopic instrument, dark energy survey, and so on. So dark energy, you know, measuring its properties and so on is certainly one very uh, noble goal to do here. 
Uh, we can also ask the question, is Einstein's theory of gravity the full uh, theory of gravity as it applies to cosmology, or does it need corrections? Uh, can we see evidence of string theory or quantum gravity in general in cosmological data? For example, you know, we could look for features, we can look for primordial gravity waves, and so on. Uh, we could be looking for to, uh, cosmological uh, topological defects, cosmic strings or, or monopoles or textures uh, up there in the sky. We could be looking for circles uh, in the sky as evidence for colliding universes. The list goes on, 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 on. And, you know, in the words of that famous uh, philosopher, American philosopher, these are all known unknowns. Um, uh, there are also unknown unknowns. In other words, all of the things we have been searching for so far, or most of the things, have been predicted by some you know, theory, and so they are limited by the imagination of our theorists. Um, if we let the data decide, um, in principle, to look for interesting patterns and report uh, back to us, well, look, there's something interesting there, maybe that's, that's another pathway to look for uh, new breakthroughs. Uh, now, for serious scientists like myself, this is always uh, problematic. Uh, you know, we start rolling our eyes and, and uh, screaming, oh, a posteriori statistics, right? You cannot really do this. It's true you cannot really easily quantify the statistical significance of something like that. But it does not mean that you cannot, uh, you know, make a breakthrough, uh, either by seeing something that can be observed in, in other data sets later, or maybe by developing a theory that exactly explains something that has been first seen in the data. And, uh, you know, and we know it works in certain applications. It's been called the unreasonable effectiveness of data by folks at Google. So in five years, we might be actually applying algorithms that will just sift through the data and, and look for interesting patterns and then report back to us and seeing uh, uh, if there's something interesting uh, there. So when you have 20 million uh, three-dimensional positions in the sky, you can really do a lot, a lot of things with that. And so whether searching for known or unknown signatures of fundamental physics, there will be lots of fun things to do, I think, in five years uh, with so much data on our hands. So stay tuned. And thank you. Thanks, Ross. Questions? No comments. Um, <clears throat> Yurosh, in your, maybe your first slide, you showed the DESI uh, if you could put that up, the, the landscape of uh, DESI, B, yeah, that one, BAO measurements. Then also you have a pointer to, uh, at higher redshifts, the uh, Lyman alpha measurements from QSOs, yeah, those in green. Um, so initial uh, uh, measurements of those from the BOSS team, I guess, uh, a few months ago reported uh, that uh, the results at, I think, were at between redshift of two, two and a half, already look about two and a half sigma off of the sort of new standard, you know, vanilla lambda CDM. Do you have any uh, reaction to that? It, I mean, it's not very many measurements to already have a two and a half sigma. Yes. Um, so, you know, um, the, the question is always, should one get excited about two and a half sigma uh, things? Uh, my answer is probably usually no. Uh, in this case, it seems like the, the latest reanalysis of this with more data and so on seems to be moving back towards the, the vanilla CDM. And so probably it's getting less and less significant. Uh, the, the, the new data release, DR12, or BOSS, will quantify this a lot better. But it looks like it's uh, not going to be 2.5 sigma anymore. It will be less than that. Other question? In your last slide, is there anybody thinking around just looking at data automated? I don't know how to do, but you know, mention yeah. it. So yeah, uh, well, so this is uh, a well-established practice in, in the field of CMB. Uh, people have come up with all sorts of uh, things, like the axis of evil, where you look for, I don't know, correlations in the CMB, you know, which is correlated, some, some structure is correlated with another structure, or you look for asymmetries. You know, they've come up with all sorts of, uh, you know, a few sigma, um, uh, effects that most people don't believe because they are so a posteriori, right? I mean, you cook up something and you start seeing something and it's, if it's only a few sigma, then you wouldn't really believe it. And so that's where, you know, in the case of CMB, that's what, what it is, situation. And so the hope is that, of course, if those things are there in the CMB, well, maybe the same uh, signals can also show up in the galaxy clustering. Uh, or if you apply just to ga galaxy clustering, then the hope is, well, if you see it in one part of the volume, maybe you'll see it in another part of the sky, and that's how you would build up the case uh, and move away from the three sigma, you know, 
uh, fake signals uh, to something real. Yeah, right? So kind of imagine like a 3D version of that here and also correlation between different measurements and so on, yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Right. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Uh, I have a question about dynamical dark energy. We're looking for variations in time of the amount of dark energy. Uh, and we quantify that with things like W and W prime. Um, if we don't see those, where would we stop? Well, um, why should we stop when we have all these other things to look for with using the same data? Right, and maybe you can think of this, well, you know, some people, yes, are interested in the variation of the dark energy equation of state, but other people are interested in curvature, and you can use exactly the same data to measure both. So maybe there's no need to stop, because there will be always questions to be answered, which are not focused on those specific, uh, you know, equation of state, but maybe it's on other things. You, the same data we can also use to measure primordial and gasanities, for example, you know, right, by using the three-point function analysis and so on. For, for coverage, where to stop is a cosmic barrier. Yeah, for cover, yeah, right, as I said, that, yeah, for exactly coverage. That's what I'm about to say. Yeah, so, right. <laughs> and that, that's significant. I mean, usually when you have a theory, there is a number that you can attach to that, and beyond that number, there's no point in keeping, you know, the search on. For curvature, for sure, yeah, it's a fundamental limit, which is going to be, you know, 4 to 10 minus 4, and that, that one, you, 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 you hit the wall there. Yeah, but for, for primordial anxiety, I don't think, you know, we can always go to larger volume and there's no, there's no limit really there how far we can go. Anything? Anything else? If not, let's thank Rosh again. Thank you.